Mark Neely, Gary Gallagher, Robert K. Crick, and Henry Thomas. He is, without question, I think one of the leading experts of war in Georgia. In fact, his next book will be about North, Northwest Georgia, focusing on questions of unionism. Uh, he also knows an extraordinary amount about the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of Tennessee. Uh, he is superb on the battlefield. Many of you are going to get the pleasure of going with Keith to Spotsylvania tomorrow and the wilderness with uh, Eric Mink, who is a historian at Fredericksburg as well. Today, Keith is going to speak on William T. Sherman and the 1864 Atlantic campaign. It's my pleasure to welcome you. started, um, the map you see up here is a campaign map with, uh, on, the, uh, on the left side, uh, the uh, inserts there, or the, the smaller maps indicate the main battles. I know it's probably difficult for those of you in the back of the room to, to see the small details and maybe read the print. Uh, and so what we did, uh, or actually what Pete's staff did, was included this in uh, your uh, maps and handouts book. So hopefully most of you have this. If you turn to page uh, nine, uh, you'll see this map in there. And you might want to refer to this. This is probably a little easier to read. But uh, we'll be making uh, frequent, uh, uh, or I'll be making frequent reference to this campaign map, which will, will help us understand the, the course of the campaign. As general in chief of uh, all Union military forces, in the spring of 1864, uh, U.S. Grant devised a grand strategy involving coordinated offenses by a number of Union armies stretching from Louisiana all the way to Virginia. And as we, you know already, the two most important of these offenses were those of the Army of the Potomac uh, here, in the, or in Virginia rather, uh, and that of William T. Sherman, uh, who commanded what was called the Military Division of the Mississippi. Grant's orders to Sherman for the campaign, dated April 4th, 1864, were pretty straightforward. Grant told Sherman to move against the Confederate Army of Tennessee, commanded by General Joseph E. Johnston, and to break it up. Then get into the interior of the enemy's country as far as you can, inflicting all the damages you can against their war resources. At the same time, Sherman was supposed to prevent Johnson from detaching uh, elements of his army to reinforce either Lee's army in Virginia or Confederate forces out in Louisiana. Uh, that is Sherman's objective then in the Atlanta campaign. If you look at Sherman's record during the Civil War up until the spring of 1864. In many ways, it's not that impressive, particularly, particularly if you look at his performance on the battlefield. If you look at Chickasaw Bluffs during the Vicksburg campaign in December of 1862, or in December of 1862, if you look at uh, Chattanooga and Missionary Ridge, uh, Sherman's, uh, uh, the attacks that Sherman has, has launched in those battles have been piecemeal, they've been repulsed, uh, he doesn't have a particularly impressive record on the battlefield. Sherman's reputation then today rests primarily on what he did in 1864 and 1865 to implement Grant's grand strategy. Sherman targeted not only uh, the Army of Tennessee, uh, but also the ability of the Southern Confederacy to wage war. And of course, this is part of Grant's larger strategy too. Uh, during the campaign in the spring and summer of 1864, uh, the city of Atlanta symbolizes uh, the, 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 the way that the Confederacy waged war. The city was a vital rail center in the Deep South and was filled with important war industries, factories and mills, turning out uniforms and shells and accoutrements for the Confederate Army. Sherman also sought to demoralize the Confederacy soldiers and civilians to prove to these people that their government could no longer defend them. 
Sherman said, war is cruelty and you cannot refine it. Sherman's an eminently quotable individual, many of you know. Uh, his letters are absolutely superb. Um, I would, uh, would highly, highly recommend Sherman's Civil War, the Selected Correspondence of William T. Sherman. It's one of the most important edited volumes in many decades. Uh, Brooks Simpson, who's on the, um, the, the faculty here, is one of the co-editors of that. Throughout the Atlanta campaign, Sherman largely avoided launching frontal attacks against his entrenched opponent. Uh, instead, what he repeatedly did was utilize maneuver, flanking movements, to wrest the Confederates from strong defensive positions. I think Sherman's greatness also derives from his mastery of logistics keeping an enormous field army supplied day after day after day, very deep in enemy territory. Sherman's army numbered over 100,000 men. It had 28,000 horses, 33,000 mules. Imagine trying to supply an army of that size day after day after day. The only way to do it, of course, was via railroads. Sherman, in the months leading up to the campaign, which began in May 1860, had hundreds and hundreds of trains uh, moving down a rail system through Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, stockpiling supplies in Nashville and Chattanooga. In Chattanooga alone, uh, between the months of March and May of 1864, there are 145 rail cars unloading on a daily basis there. So he's building uh, supply bases that he'll need as he advances into Georgia. During the campaign, he had about 5,000 wagons that were constantly on the move from the railroad to the army in the field. As Richard McMurray, who's one of the foremost scholars of the Atlanta campaign, writes in what's one of the best overviews of the campaign, and like some of the other speakers you've heard, I'm going to throw out some book titles. If you're like me, you love books uh, about the Civil War. Uh, Nick Murray's Atlanta 1864 is a, a very, very, very good overview. If you're looking for one book that gives you an overview, uh, Decision in the West by Albert Castell is, is also a, an outstanding book. But Nick Murray says, uh, points out that Sherman had a couple of big advantages over his opponent uh, at the start of the Atlanta campaign. First, Sherman had command of a vast department that stretched from the Appalachian Mountains uh, in the east all the way to the Mississippi River. He had command of the troops within this vast military uh, division in Mississippi. Johnson, on the other hand, commanded a much smaller department. He had no authority, Johnson that is, over the states of Alabama and Mississippi. He couldn't order troops from those states to join his army uh, fighting in Georgia. Sherman also had the strong support of his military and civilian superiors. Sherman and Grant had a very close relationship, uh, and the Lincoln administration was also very supportive of Sherman's campaigns. And then lastly, Sherman had an army that, on average, during the campaign, was about 40% uh, larger than that of the Army of Tennessee. At the start of the campaign, uh, Sherman's three armies numbered uh, around 110,000 men. Uh, Sherman commanded what I believe today would be called an army group, but that term didn't exist in the 1860s. He commanded three separate armies. The largest of these was the Army of the Cumberland, which numbered close to 73,000 men at the start of the campaign, commanded by General George H. Thomas, a professional soldier. And if you look again at, at performance on the battlefield, Thomas actually had a far more impressive record than William T. Sherman. Thomas, in fact, had won the first major military victory in the West, up in Kentucky, in 1862. He performed superbly at Chickamauga, actually saved the Union Army at Chickamauga, as many of you probably know. Thomas's troops had shattered the Confederate lines at Missionary Ridge. Thomas was an impressive soldier. Uh, and some historians have even argued that Thomas would have made a better commander of the federal armies during the Atlanta campaign than Sherman. But, but, Thomas did not have a very good 
working relationship with Ulysses S. Grant. And Brooks Simpson actually alluded to this yesterday in his talk when he was talking, talking about um, the, the Tennessee campaign in 1864. Uh, and then Thomas also had a reputation as being a very slow, very methodical soldier, and that caused Sherman some frustration during the Atlanta campaign, actually. So Thomas is a very, very important subordinate, but he's an army commander during the campaign under Sherman. The second largest of uh, Sherman's armies uh, was his old command, Sherman's old command, the Army of the Tennessee. Uh, it was his favorite army, uh, and it was also uh, the most successful Union army of the Civil War. Uh, a recent book on the, uh, on the Army of the Tennessee by Stephen Woodworth is entitled Nothing But Victory, and that army never knew defeat on the battlefield. Uh, its commander during the uh, Atlanta campaign was James B. McPherson, a West Point graduate. He served on Grant's staff earlier uh, in the Civil War, and he was a great, great favorite of both Grant and Sherman. In fact, both men wrote that they could see McPherson commanding all the Union armies. Uh, Sherman writes a letter uh, during the campaign, I believe that it, it predicts if something happens to him, if something happens to Grant, he feels confident that McPherson can take command of the Union armies and win ultimate victory. The smallest of Sherman's armies, which in fact is just a single corps, is the Army of the Ohio. It numbers about close to 13,000 men uh, under General John M. Schofield, uh, a West Pointer and someone who, who Sherman trusts uh, and, and who performs very well during the campaign. Sherman also had three divisions of cavalry numbering about 8,900 men. Uh, although Sherman doesn't think very much of his cavalry generals or that branch of the service, I think you can rightfully criticize Sherman for his employment, his poor employment really, of, of cavalry during the Atlanta campaign. And he, he thinks, he in fact thinks that the Confederate cavalry is superior to his. He's particularly worried throughout the campaign about the Confederate cavalry out in Alabama and Mississippi under Nathan B. Far Nathan Bedford Forrest. The close relationship that existed between Sherman and his military and civilian superiors stood in stark contrast, stark contrast, to the relationship between Joseph E. Johnston and Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The two men did not like each other at all. And this uh, wrangling and the, the strained relationship between the two dated back to the earliest days of the war when uh, there was wrangling over the issue of rank, which general should, be, uh, should, should have the highest rank in the Confederate Army. Uh, Bob Crick has written a superb uh, essay about uh, about this, about Joe Johnson. Uh, and so the relationship between the two men is very, very strained during the Atlanta campaign, too. In the months prior to the advent of the campaign, uh, so March, April of 1864, Jefferson Davis had uh, repeatedly uh, asked Johnson to go on the defensive. Now, on your maps, if you look in the, um, uh, in the corner up there, uh, it would be your upper left hand corner. Uh, you can see the red lines on the map up here uh, indicate uh, the Confederate positions taken during the campaign. The blue lines are the, the federal positions. Uh, uh, during the first few months of 1864, the Confederates are encamped around the town of Dalton in extreme northwest Georgia. The army had been shattered uh, at the Battle of Missionary Ridge in November of 1863 under the command of Braxton Bragg. It had been a humiliating, disastrous defeat for the army. Uh, and Johnson is brought in, and Johnson, in some ways, is like George McClellan, and that he's a superb organizer uh, and motivator of men. Johnson rebuilds the army. He boosts the morale of the soldiers. And the soldiers, the Confederate soldiers in the Army of Tennessee, love Joe Johnson and respect him. They know that he cares about their welfare. So that's really one of Johnson's great strong points as a general. 
But while he's rebuilding the Army of Tennessee in its winter camps, Jefferson Davis repeatedly asked Johnson to take the offensive against the Federals who were camped not all that far north of Dalton in the vicinity of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So Davis wants Johnson to march up into East Tennessee. But Johnson claims his army is outnumbered by the Yankees. Uh, the Army of Tennessee doesn't have the adequate supplies or logistical capability of marching up into East Tennessee. Now, unfortunately for Johnson, the Davis administration is getting very different of, of reports concerning the, the uh, Army of Tennessee from some of Johnson's subordinates. So his corps commanders, his cavalry commander, they're sending back reports that the Army's in great shape and, and should take the offensive. So the Davis administration is unsure who to believe, although Davis is more inclined to believe the corps commanders, I think, than, than Johnson. During the campaign then, up until the time of his removal, one of Joe Johnson's chief weaknesses is his continual failure, day after day, week after week, to provide Davis and his administration with detailed, regular reports of what's going on. If you look in the correspondence section of the official records and compare Lee's correspondence with Davis during the Overland campaign with what Joe Johnson was sending, there's a stark contrast. Johnson's wife, in late May 1864, suggested to her husband that it might be a good idea for him to keep the government better informed of what his plans are. And Johnson says, uh, it's a reply to her, that uh, her suggestion was a judicious one, but that, quote, the people in Richmond take no interest in any partial affairs that may occur in this quarter. Suggesting, obviously, that what Jefferson Davis is really concerned about are events in Virginia. Johnson's strategy then in the spring of 1864 was to remain in a strong defensive position around Dalton behind a, a high ridge line just west of the town called Rocky Face Ridge. You can see it on your maps there. Uh, and await an attack by the Federals. Uh, and when the Federals attacked, the Confederates would defeat them. After gaining the victory, Johnson would then move uh, probably west into Alabama and then north up into Tennessee. Johnson's army at its peak strength uh, in uh, a few weeks into the campaign, the Atlanta campaign when he receives reinforcements, was about 69,000, close to 70,000 men, divided into three corps under the command of William J. Hardy, uh, John Bell Hood, and the Bishop General uh, Leonidas Polk. Polk had actually commanded a separate army that was brought in called the Army of Mississippi and that became a corps in Johnson's army. Johnson also had a cavalry corps that numbered between seven and 8,000 men under the diminutive uh, Joseph Weaver. The campaign began in uh, the first week of May of 1864. And Sherman's plan, which was actually a plan that George Thomas had uh, uh, originally devised and that Sherman uh, ad ad adopted, was for, uh, with some modification, Sherman modified what uh, Thomas had envisioned. But Sherman's plan is to have the Army of the Ohio and the Army of the Cumberland to demonstrate against the Confederate positions north of, and west of Dalton. So keep Johnson's attention focused in the immediate vicinity of Dalton. McPherson's army then would march west, south, and west of Rocky Face Ridge. And you can see on the map up here, again in the upper left-hand corner, the movements of the three armies, or you can, can look on your, your map there. McPherson was to march 12 miles south of Dalton, but west of Rocky Face Ridge, cross through a narrow passage called Snake Creek Gap. This is an... an come out on the, the eastern side of this ridge line, uh, and then break Johnson's supply line, the Western and Atlantic Railroad, in the vicinity of Dalton. And the Western Atlantic is, is uh, the, the supply line for both armies during the Atlantic campaign. It was a railroad uh, that stretched from Chattanooga, which is in the far uh, upper left-hand corner of your map, to Atlanta, which is in the bottom 
center of your map. So both armies are relying on the Western Atlantic. It was a good plan. Uh, it was a very good plan. And initially, uh, it unfolded just as Sherman hoped it would. Uh, on May the 8th, uh, the Thomas's troops in Schofields demonstrated against Rocky Face Ridge. McPherson makes his march down. He gets through Snake Creek Gap, which the Confederates had left unguarded. They've been there all winter. They had a, and one of Johnson's, one of the criticisms you can level at Johnson is that even though he'd been in camps around Dalton for many months, he really had to study the geography very closely south of the, the town. Uh, the Confederates certainly knew about Snake Creek Gap, but uh, Wheeler didn't have any pickets uh, 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 protecting it. So Johnson's men are able to march through without uh, a fight. Uh, but, uh, and then when they uh, come out of the eastern end of the gap, very short distance in front of them is the western Atlantic. They see some earthworks though around the small town of Versaca. Clearly there's some Confederates there, uh, but McPherson didn't have any cavalry with him, which was, which was a, a terrible mistake on the part of the Federals. And McPherson becomes worried. He doesn't know how many Confederates are in front of him. He's also worried that if he continues advancing toward the railroad, that uh, Confederates might march down from Dalton uh, and strike him in the flank as he's moving east. So instead of pushing forward, seizing the western and Atlantic, cutting Johnson's supply line, McPherson instead pulls his army back to Snake Creek Gap. When Johnson learns of this, because the Confederates did have a small contingent of cavalry here for second, Johnson orders a retreat, a very well organized one, of his troops from the Dalton vicinity southward to Versaca. McPherson had lost an enormous opportunity to strike a crippling blow at the Confederates. Sherman realized this. And he wrote to McPherson, I regret beyond measure you did not break the railroad. Sherman realizes that there's a big opportunity that's been lost here. On May 14th and 15th, the first major battle of the campaign is fought at Resaca, a place that's uh, just recently been opened as a state park. The, the battlefield is beautifully preserved. John, both armies are fortified there, like uh, during the Overland Campaign, these armies are, are constructing log and dirt breastworks whenever they halt for any appreciable period of time. Both armies launched attacks at Brissaca uh, that fail. Uh, tactically then, the two-day battle is a draw, but at the operational level, Sherman scores a great victory by getting across a river just south of Brissaca, the, the Ustanala, gets one division across uh, at a ferry site and threatens the western and Atlantic south of Versaca and forces Johnson to retreat. Johnson retreats, and you can look in the middle of your um, map now, uh, he retreats down to the vicinity of a small town called Castle, and there he hopes to lay a trap for Sherman. Uh, the road network is such that Sherman ends up dividing his armies as they march south. And Johnson's plan was to strike uh, uh, one of these wings of Sherman's army at Castle as it marched south. Uh, but unfortunately for Johnson, uh, John Bell Hood, who's been ordered to launch this attack, doesn't do so. Uh, and then uh, in a, a conference, a night conference that, that's held between Johnson and his corps commanders, uh, Hood and Leonidas Polk argue that the army needed to retreat yet again at Castle. Their line was being enfiladed by Union artillery. And exactly what happened at this conference and who said what was a point of bitter contention between Joe Johnson and John Bell Hood for many, many, many years. Each had a very different version of what, what happened there that's actually really impossible to reconcile. But uh, and we don't need to go into the details of it now, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the Johnson's version is that he, uh, he saw that his corps commanders didn't have any confidence that they could hold this position, and so the army retreated yet again. Sherman 
at this point is pretty optimistic about the course of the campaign up to this point. And in a wonderfully uh, evocative phrase, uh, or, or passage rather, he said, uh, writes, um, this is at the beginning, this is in mid-May, we are now in motion like a vast hive of bees and expect to swarm over the Chattahoochee in a few days. The Chattahoochee was a river flowing uh, from east to west that would be the last natural barrier between Sherman and Atlanta. By the beginning of the third week of May, Johnson's army was entrenched in a very strong position in the Alatoona Mountains. And you can see it on your map there, just below the Etowah River. Sherman was very familiar with the Alatoona Mountains, and in fact, all the, the geography of this entire uh, section of Georgia. He had spent time here uh, in the 1840s as a young army officer. He'd been stationed here. Johnson, uh, Sherman knew that it would be foolish Foolish to try and attack Johnson's position at, in the Alatoona Mountains. And so what Sherman decides to do instead is execute yet another flanking march. Uh, this one would involve some risk, though, because it would, it, would, uh, it would move the Union Army some miles away from the western and Atlantic, about 15 miles away. The uh, objective of this march would be the town of Dallas, and you can see it there in the lower left-hand corner of the map with Schofield, Thomason at first, and all taking different routes uh, to get there. It's about 15 miles west of the Alatoona uh, position that Johnson held, 15 miles west of the uh, railroad. But Johnson's cavalry uh, informed him in pretty timely fashion of this movement toward Dallas, and Johnson shifts away from Alatoona westward to try and block Sherman once again. What ensued then in the final days, the uh, last week of May and the first couple of days of June, was some intense uh, skirmishing every day, punctuated by three small battles, two of them involving Union attacks against the uh, Confederates that failed in the third uh, a failed Confederate attack, New Hope Church, Pickettsville, and Dallas. Uh, the fighting in this densely wooded uh, region uh, was such that the soldiers on both sides called it the hell hole. When Sherman realized that Johnson's lines were pretty strong uh, along the Dallas New Hope Pickett's Mill line, and that it would be impractical for him to continue south to go around the western flank of Johnson's army because it would keep the Union forces away from the railroad for too long, he decided to shift back eastward toward the western Atlantic. In fact, for a few days at the very end of May, Sherman's army was experiencing some pretty serious uh, supply shortages. They'd simply been away from the army too long. And even though 5,000 wagons sounds like a lot, with an army of the, the size of Sherman's, uh, it's, it's really not sufficient to, to supply it day after day that far from the rear road. So both armies shift back over toward the railroad. But, and then the skies open up, and it starts to rain. And it continues to rain over and over and over, day after day, for the first few weeks of June. Both armies are nearly immobilized. You can imagine trying to move enormous wagon trains down mud, uh, down roads that are knee-deep in mud. Uh, you can imagine being in a trench that's maybe full up to your knees in, in water and mud. Hundreds of men on a daily basis in both armies are sent to the rear. They're broken down physically. And this actually continues throughout the campaign. The campaign is similar to the Overland campaign in that the armies are in constant contact. There's constant skirmishing day after day after day. No rest, really, if you're in the trenches on the front line. And, and that takes an enormous toll on everyone in the armies. Sherman becomes frustrated then. The pace of his advance has slowed. And he makes a decision to deviate from the strategy that has been successful up until this point, the flanking 
maneuvers. He writes Chief of Staff Henry Halleck on June 16, 1864, I'm now inclined to feign on both flanks and assault the center of the Confederate line. It may cost us dear, but the result would surpass any attempt to pass around. Johnson's army by this time was defending a line eight miles long. Sherman's rationale is that there's, there's got to be some weak, some weak points in that line. And that with the element of surprise, frontal attacks directed against the center of Johnson's line might succeed and score a great victory. If it doesn't work, Sherman could just once again go back to conducting flanking maneuvers. There's also some evidence in both Sherman's personal and official correspondence that like a lot of career army officers at the time of the Civil War, he felt that fighting for prolonged periods behind earthworks could damage the morale of the men. That it, it would make them timid, in fact. Uh, John Bell Hood uh, is very uh, open about this. And uh, his postbellum memoir, Advance and Retreat, claims that Lee feels the same, felt the same way. So Sherman orders attacks. And the resulting battle of Kennesaw Mountain, fought on June the 27th of 1864, uh, was a costly defeat for Sherman. Uh, the troops that launched the attacks were uh, Union soldiers were bloodily repulsed. They suffered about 3,000 casualties. Sherman took a lot of heat from the northern press. His men were disheartened. But if you look at the losses that Sherman's army has sustained up to this point in the campaign, including at Kennesaw Mountain, they paled in comparison to what was happening in Virginia. Compare the losses, for instance, in just a single day of fighting in the wilderness to the 3,000 casualties sustained at Kennesaw, and you'll see that, uh, that Sherman is taking a lot of territory and suffering relatively few losses as a result. The only success of the day at Kennesaw, that was the phrase that Sherman used, uh, didn't occur uh, when, the, uh, when these failed attacks against Johnson's line, but in a flanking maneuver launched by um, Schofield's army on the, against the far southern end of Johnson's long line. Schofield actually managed to get his troops closer to the Chattahoochee than Johnson, and this is what forced Johnson to abandon the Kennesaw line and fall back to a line that had been constructed by enormous numbers of impressed slaves along the Chattahoochee River. So Sherman's troops advanced to the Chattahoochee. The Confederates were in a position that's clearly impregnable. It would, would have been fool crazy to attack it. But in one of the most masterful maneuvers that Sherman executes during the whole campaign, he manages to cross troops uh, north of Johnson's position this is the first time he's gone around Johnson's right flank instead of his left flank. And by the uh, second week of July, then, Johnson abandons the Chattahoochee line, falls back, and at that point, he's right on the outskirts of Atlanta. You can see on the map, look at the bottom center of the map, where the Chattahoochee River runs. You can see Schofield and McPherson's troops crossing the river north of the um, Confederates river line, and when the Confederates retreat across the Chattahoochee, they are right on the outskirts of the gate city of Atlanta, as it was called. Sherman had achieved something pretty remarkable at this point. He had taken all of northwest Georgia, a region that was important in terms of agriculture and industry to the Confederacy, he was on the outskirts of Atlanta, and he had an army that was still strong in both numbers and morale. Contrast that to the condition of the Army of the Potomac when it gets to the outskirts of Petersburg. And the morale of the army is, is pretty shaky, right? By this point, Joe Johnson, or excuse me, by this point, Jefferson Davis, 
has had enough of Joe Johnson. Jefferson Davis has lost faith in Joe Johnson's ability to hold the city of Atlanta. Johnson had repeatedly told the Davis administration and politicians who visited his headquarters that the best way to force the Federals out of North Georgia is to strike their, the Western and Atlantic Railroad, strike their supply line in North Georgia and end up into Tennessee. But Johnson claimed that his army, or excuse me, his cavalry, Joe Wheeler's cavalry corps, couldn't do this. Johnson couldn't afford to detach his own cavalry from his army because he needed Wheeler's horsemen to defend the flanks of the army as it, retreat, as it fell back. Sure, Johnson didn't have enough men to stretch the line long enough. So what Johnson proposed over and over and over was for the Davis administration to order the Confederate cavalry and Alabama and Mississippi forced command to ride east to break Sherman's supply line. This would involve stripping the states of Alabama and Mississippi of all of their defenders. And that was something that Davis, I think wisely, refused to do. As Richard McMurray and others have pointed out, Alabama and Mississippi were pretty important states. Uh, stripping those states of their defenders would have opened up the rich agricultural region at the time they be River Valley. Uh, they would, would have opened up important industrial cities like Selma, uh, Alabama, Columbus, Georgia would not have been a smart move. And it's highly debatable too whether Forrest Smith could actually have uh, created enough damage to, uh, in the long term for, uh, for Sherman to have to retreat. Sherman was acutely aware that his supply line was vulnerable and he went to some lengths to try and protect it and, and don't have time to talk about the ways, but, but we can later if you're interested. So on July 17th, 1864, Jefferson Davis makes the extremely controversial decision. It was controversial in the summer of 1864. It's still controversial today of relieving Joe Johnson of command and replacing him with one of his corps commanders, John Bell Hood, an officer probably all of you know who had gained a reputation in 1862 and 1863 uh, as one of Lee's best brigade and division commanders. He had a reputation as being a very bold fighter. And he, of course, had personally sacrificed a lot. You all know the nature of his wounds, the loss of a leg, uh, Chickamauga, the partial loss of a, a Eastman arm here at Gettysburg. In the message that relieved uh, Joe Johnson, the Secretary of War said, as you have failed to arrest the advance of the enemy, to the vicinity of Atlanta, far in the interior of Georgia, and express no confidence that you can defeat or repel him, you are hereby relieved. So Hood takes command, and he has a mandate, a very clear mandate, that he has to fight for the city of Atlanta. He doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver. Uh, and there's some evidence, incidentally, uh, of that Hood had been angling for this command that uh, sometime prior to, to getting it. He was an intensely ambitious officer. Johnson then was, a, in retrospect, as my friend Joe Gladhar has written, a general who, quote, lacked the ability to shape campaigns. Throughout his career, he reacted to the moves of his opponents rather than seizing the initiative. And that was clearly the case in the Atlanta campaign. But the Army of Tennessee needed, but couldn't get, of course, was Robert E. Lee. Hood, upon taking command, immediately ordered attacks. You can see the first of the three main battles that uh, were fought around the city in the uh, upper, uh, very top, the middle of, of your um, map, the Battle of Peachtree Creek. Hood's plan was to attack the Union forces advancing against Atlanta from the north after they crossed Peachtree Creek, but before they could entrench. He devoted two corps of his army to this attack. They were supposed to, uh, his corps commanders were supposed to send their uh, units forward in echelon. Uh, the attacks, though, ended up being uncoordinated, not very well managed by the corps commanders, 
And after hard fighting, uh, the Federals managed to hold their lines. Uh, the Confederate casualties in Peachtree Creek numbered about 2,500, while the Federals were about 2,100. There's a fine new book on the battle, a very detailed tactical study by my friend Robert Jenkins that I recommend. Uh, just the study of Peachtree Creek. We're only now getting detailed battle studies of the West, while there have been ones Eastern battles for many decades. The day after the Battle of Peachtree Creek, uh, Hood learns that the left, far left flank of the Union troops that are approaching Atlanta from the east is vulnerable. It's in the air. And Hood decides to try and execute a flanking march to strike this, uh, this vulnerable portion of Sherman's line. This is part of the uh, Army of the Tennessee under McPherson. Hood orders a very long flank march to take place during the night of July 21st by the troops under Hardy. These are men who had already had an exhausting 48 hours beforehand. They fought heavily east of the city on July 21st. What Hood was asking his men to do was simply unrealistic in terms of the, their physical abilities. Uh, of these exhausted soldiers. Hood was also handicapped by having a corps commanders that were pretty inexperienced at that high level of command. Nonetheless, the flag march is executed, and on July 22nd, the largest battle of the campaign is fought. This is the one immortalized in the, uh, the cyclorama, the enormous uh, circular painting in, in Atlanta. Uh, the, the map in the upper right-hand corner gives you some sense of the, the battle. Uh, it was, in fact, a single bloody state of fighting in the last 10 months of the Civil War. The Confederates did achieve some temporary success. Some of Hardy's troops break through the Union line. They captured large numbers of prisoners and cannon. They killed General James B. McPherson. One of the highest ranking Union generals to die in the war. This was a huge personal blow to Sherman, as you can imagine. But at the end of the day, the Federals launch counterattacks. They retake the portions of their lines that the Confederates had seized. And even though many Confederates at the time saw this as a victory because they were counting prisoners and cannon and flags captured, in retrospect, this was an army that, or excuse me, a battle that cost Hood's army very heavily. There's a new book on this battle, fairly new, it came out a few years ago, called The Day Dixie Died, which is another one I would recommend by Gary Ecclebar, who's a very fine historian. Uh, Hood's army lost between probably between 5,700 and 6,300 men in that single day of fighting. Following the battle, Sherman decided to change his strategy and reorient his efforts to take the city from the east of Atlanta to the west of Atlanta with hopes of cutting the last railroad into the city that led, uh, in, that led south of Atlanta. At the same time, Sherman tries to launch cavalry raids that will ride around the eastern and western approaches of the city and wreck the, the rail line south of the city. Hood responds to these movements by sending a corps out west of Atlanta to block the federal movements out there. This is under the, the, the troops that Hood sends out there under a very, very inexperienced uh, corps commander named S.D. Lee, who's a close friend of Hood's. Lee gets out to the, the area where he's supposed to be. Uh, he thinks the Federals out there aren't uh, uh, just arrived, they aren't entrenched, and he takes it upon himself to start a battle. He doesn't have any orders to do this from Hood, but Lee starts launching frontal attacks, throwing one division after another at these Federals. And the Federals are the Army of the Tennessee, the men, remember I mentioned, who've never known defeat. And what happens in the Battle of Desert Church is Kennesaw Mountain in reverse. It's the Confederates losing heavily attacking fortified Federals, and the, the casualties are, are dramatically lopsided. Uh, Hood's army loses about 3,000 men in these attacks. The Federals lose only about 600 casualties at Desert Church. <clears throat> 
that rage. Uh, so Ezra Church is a great victory for Sherman, but the cavalry raids he launched proved disastrous. The federal divisions that rode south of the city um, ended up being smashed by uh, Joe Wheeler in the Confederate cavalry. This is Wheeler's finest performance of his career. Uh, and um, this lowers Sherman's already poor opinion of his cavalry corps and, and convinces him that cavalry can't wreck a railroad. It's going to take more than that. Hood had not achieved what he wanted in these three battles, and none of them, incidentally, were intended to be frontal attacks against entrenched Union soldiers. In each instance, what Hood was trying to execute was a flank attack, uh, and it, they didn't work. Uh, but cumulatively, these battles did have the effect of making Sherman a little more cautious than he had been. Uh, uh, Sherman's, uh, two of Sherman's corps commanders had been classmates of Hood and knew him very well when first in, in Schofield, and they knew his reputation, and Sherman did too. So in the first few weeks of August, there's a semi-siege of Atlanta. The city's not completely surrounded, but Sherman brings up big guns, big siege guns, and bombards the city. Sherman's also trying to get around the city uh, to the uh, uh, to the west. He's having some problems. He's, uh, he, Sherman's facing a, a discharge of 10,000 of his men at this point in August. He also tells Halleck in the first week of August that he's too impatient for a siege. Sherman's a pretty nervous, impatient, anxious individual. He doesn't want a long, drawn-out affair like what happened in Petersburg, certainly. So he decides on a bold plan. Sherman decides to abandon the siege lines east and north of Atlanta, pull his troops out of the trenches, leave a single corps north of the city to hold uh, the point where his supply line, the western Atlantic, crosses the Chattahoochee River. Leave one corps up there, but take the rest of the army on a wide flanking march to the west and southwest and south of Atlanta. That's shown in the lower right-hand corner of your map. And cut the Macon and Western Railroad south of the city. Sherman Vinton was convinced by this point that cavalry raids couldn't do the job when it came to wrecking railroads. So Sherman's infantrymen pull out of the trenches, they march around, and in the very last days of August, they reach the Macon and Western. Hood, in the meantime, had sent his cavalry off to do what Johnson had not been willing to do. We were sent off on a raid to try and disrupt Sherman's supply lines up into North Georgia and Tennessee. Wheeler's raids a spectacular failure. He wrecks his cavalry corps in the process. So at first, when Hood receives news that the federal trenches north of the city are vacant, what do you think he believes? Wheeler's raid's been a success. Sherman's retreating to the north. But then he realizes he, Hood, what's going on. And he dispatches two corps south to the vicinity of Jonesboro. If you look on the map down there on the lower right, you'll see Jonesboro at the very bottom. And the two corps sent down there are given the orders to push the Army of the Tennessee away from the railroad, protect that vital supply line. And they're, they're, on the first day of the Battle of Jonesboro, the last battle of the campaign, these um, Two corps, Confederate corps launch attacks that are, are, are repulsed. In the meantime, uh, Hood finds out that the um, that his rail lines north of Jonesboro have been broken. You can see that on the map with Tom, uh, Thomas and Schofield, and he abandons the city, Hood, on the night of September 1st, marching the troops in the city south to rejoin those who had been at Jonesboro. During the evacuation of the city, the Confederates discovered they left a large train of munitions uh, in the eastern uh, central portion of Atlanta that obviously can't get out. 
And so they set it on fire. This is 28 boxcars full of explosives. And you can imagine uh, the, uh, the, the sound that was heard 15, 20 miles away. This is the scene, incidentally, that's depicted in Gone with the Wind when uh, Red is in the wagon trying to get uh, Scarlet and Melanie and the baby out, and there's all the, the sets burning in the background. Uh, I always I told my kids that some of those sets were from The Wizard of Oz, uh, which is true, and uh, they don't care anything about Gone with the Wind, but they were upset that the, the sets were kind of burned in 1939. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, it, it's worth pointing out that here that the destruction of Atlanta uh, cannot be attributed solely to Uncle Billy Sherman. That Hood's army, in fact, began the process with the, with the evacuation and the, 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 uh, the destruction of the firing of this train. Uh, and, and Sherman took it uh, uh, a good bit further, of course, in November, just before the march to the sea. On September 2nd, the mayor of Atlanta, James Calhoun, surrendered the city. Sherman announced to Abraham Lincoln, uh, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. Sherman also told Halleck, I shall not push much farther on this raid. This is an interesting word to, to characterize the campaign. Uh, the constant battles and skirmishing since the first week of May, Sherman said, it exhausted the army and it needed rest. So Atlanta turned into a, a garrison. City. News of the fall of the city, of course, caused great celebration in the North. It gave a, a desperately needed boost to the fortunes of the Republican Party. And here, here is where we get to the significance of the Atlanta campaign. What makes it so important? Along with, uh, so the fall of Atlanta, along with the victories won by Phil Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley later in September, helped to boost the confidence of Northern voters that the Lincoln administration was going to win an ultimate victory and that the president needed a second term in office. So the fall of Atlanta helped to reassure the uh, re-election of Lincoln and also offered public affirmation of his war policy that Lincoln gets a popular mandate you all know, to continue a war that would end on the basis of both reunion and emancipation, something that wouldn't have been the case if the Democrats had won. At the same time, the fall of Atlanta and Lincoln's re-election helped ensure that U.S. Grant would remain as general-in-chief and Sherman as his chief lieutenant, and that these two men would be the architects of ultimate Union victory in the Civil War. Thank you. not only on matters pertaining to the Eastern Theater, but also on command matters in the West. When Davis was considering re uh, uh, removing Joe Johnson from command, he asked uh, Lee, uh, who do you think would be a, a good replacement? Uh, Lee said that Hood was a bold fighter on the battlefield, but and this is paraphrasing, I should know this verbatim, but uh, Hood said something, at least it's up to the fact that Hood is a bold fighter, bold on the battlefield, but careless off the battlefield. And, and I think what he was saying there was that when it comes to administrative responsibilities, uh, that, that Hood, um, Hood had some weaknesses there. Yes, sir. Two questions. Uh -huh. well, well, let's do one so other folks will get a chance. Well, um, uh, I'll go on down to the box, and my question is it's how did Sherman come up with the idea of that? Uh, the Sherman, the Sherman is not 
Oh, okay. So the question is, how did Sherman? That's a great question. How did Sherman come up with the uh, the uh, idea for Sherman's knots or Sherman's bow ties, as they were sometimes called? And what he's asking about uh, are the are the twisted rails uh, when the Union troops would wreck rail lines, the Confederates too for this matter, the Confederates employed this prior to the Atlantic campaign. You get thousands of infantrymen to stand next to a rail line and all at once they would lift up the, ra the, the, the cross ties, uh, separate with hammers the rail, the iron rail from the wooden cross ties pile up the wooden cross ties in huge heaps and create bonfires, lay the iron, put the iron rails on the end of the bonfires, and then when the center of the iron rails turns red hot, um, they would, the Union soldiers would grab it, and I was rereading this the other evening, and thought, I wonder if they use gloves, because those, <laughs> those ties must have been pretty damn hot. But anyway, uh, they would take the, the red hot rails, I think just red hot in the center, and then twist them around uh, trees, which would make it extraordinarily difficult for the Confederates to straighten out and reuse. And there's some good photographs taken of, of this process downtown. And, but your question was one I really can't answer. My kind of gut feeling is that it wasn't Sherman that uh, devised this, but it was something that engineers and soldiers came up with. And it had been employed prior to this time. I mean, Sherman had wrecked railroads in eastern Mississippi, the, um, uh, in, in the Meridian Expedition. So, um, but that's a great question. I don't know where it originated. I don't know if we, we actually know, but it was, became a pretty common procedure. Yes, sir. I want to get back to the Anaconda plan. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> okay. Basically, uh, Campaigns of 64, Grant and Sherman. Uh, this war had switched from in 61, 62 to capturing capitals and capturing territories and capital cities to capturing manufacturing and supply centers. Uh, Sherman was marching towards Atlanta. Page was marching towards Texas to capture their people. Could you tell us a little bit how important to the war effort and the Confederate war effort? Were these people as supplies? Sure, uh, Atlanta was absolutely vital. Uh, Georgia had some of the, the, the largest manufacturing centers in the Confederacy, not just Atlanta, but Augusta. Uh, in the eastern part of the state, had the largest power mill in the world. Uh, there were uh, uh, quartermaster depots in Atlanta, Columbus, and uh, Augusta that produced enormous numbers of uniforms for the army. There were uh, foundries that produced cannon. Uh, if you look at the rail network of the Deep South, uh, it's evident immediately how important Atlanta is for being at the juncture of, of many railroads. Uh, you know, we could go on and on about the, the contractors that, that were producing pistols and rifle muskets and Accoutrements, all different kind of accoutrements. They're just they're ab absolutely vital, and the Confederates realize that. Although by the time the siege takes place at, at, of Atlanta, uh, the city's value as a center of industry has really declined dramatically because the Confederates had, had evacuated so much of the machinery and so many of the workers and sent them south to Columbus and, and Macon. Um, so there's only about 3,000 civilians left in Atlanta when Sherman seizes the city. And when he takes the city, he, he orders the expulsion of all those civilians, which is a fascinating story, too. Um, yes, sir. Uh, John Lester, Chicago, Illinois. You mentioned at the beginning of uh, your talk, Sherman's mastery of logistics during the campaign. Uh, how much of that did he directly oversee, and, and how much of it was delegated to somebody else and for who for that matter was it delegated to? Sure, uh, that's a great question. I mean, uh, Sherman certainly had very capable uh, subordinates, uh, staff uh, that, that would, uh, that would uh, look after various logistical concerns. Uh, he had authority over the railroads. This had been a controversial matter in the months leading up to the campaign. 
He had banned all civilian traffic on some of the main railroads leading south out of Nashville. Um, and uh, he had planned for uh, uh, the Confederates to try and break the railroads by um, stockpiling rails and ties at various locations. He had his crews of civilians, uh, African Americans uh, who were employed as civilian laborers, engineers that could very quickly rebuild railroads, particularly bridges. As the Confederates retreated, if you look on your map, you can see the Confederates retreated across several uh, rivers, the Ustanala, the Etowah, the Chattahoochee. They would always burn these bridges, and it was truly remarkable how quickly Sherman's uh, engineers and laborers could rebuild these huge wooden spans. Um, so uh, that's where the, the real mastery of logistics one more, one more question over here. Al Mackey from Cambridge, Pennsylvania. Uh, General Hood has been undergoing a bit of a reevaluation of right. the generalship uh, recently. Uh, it seems to me that his plans, uh, once he took over as commander of the Army of Tennessee, were fairly good plans on paper. It's just that his army couldn't execute them for one reason or another. Uh, could you comment uh, uh, briefly on Hood's generalship as the commander of the Army of Tennessee? Sure. Uh, uh, Hood is, uh, doesn't, certainly doesn't have the mastery of logistics that Sherman does, and that becomes painfully evident during the, uh, during the Tennessee campaign in 1864. But Hood's operating under some pretty severe handicaps, not only his own physical handicaps, but he also has a command structure with a lot of generals who are woefully inexperienced at their at division and corps level of command, and they just they, they don't execute Hood's orders and don't carry out his plans the way he had envisioned them. But I think the other important factor is that Hood's plans are just unrealistic given the time constraints that he's working under and the physical conditions of his men. Uh, the, the, and the, the hardy flank march in Atlanta is a prime example of that. Hood was just asking far too much of men who were already totally exhausted. So that's kind of a short answer. But the, uh, the renaissance you're talking about, that's not the right word to use. The reevaluation of Hood's uh, generalship is one that you're right is taking place with authors like uh, Richard McMurray and Steve Davis and some others. Thank you.